if I make my notes up, it's not working. Technology doesn't really love it. I'm going to put background first of all. Um, forgive me if this is something you know already. Uh, I'm glad Duncan's not here because he would undoubtedly correct me on several things. But it's a bit of background about Latvia and, and, and Riga and the situation there. Um, after World War II, the US, um, Latvia became part of the USSR, uh, along with several others, became one of the Soviet, Soviet republics. Uh, and as a result, a large number of Russians came to live in Latvia. In 1991, they gained independence. Apparently, uh, it was implied at the time when the vote was taken that everybody resident in Latvia at the time would gain citizenship, but that didn't actually happen. And um, as a result, a large number are officially, this is an official title, non-citizens. They have no passport, they are not citizens of any country whatsoever, so there are, a number of them are therefore homeless. It's estimated, I've got a figure somewhere, uh, yeah, 250,000 in Latvia are currently classed as non-citizens, no passports, um, and they cannot vote. So, they are homeless, they can stay in hostels at night for a limited number of nights a year and on the day they're in the streets. Now, Duncan referred to the temperature in northern Latvia at the moment. Uh, the Barbara Centre where I was and where some of you are, I think have also been I'm talking about is in Riga. The current temperature is minus nine in Riga, that's in the town. And it's today's low is predicted as minus 16. So if you fancy being outside all day in minus 16, not pleasant. It's going to be worse on Tuesday though, it's going to be minus 22, with a high of minus 15. Compared to Croydon, which is a minus 2 today, was the low, and on Tuesday a high of plus 1, and a low of minus 4. So that's about 15, 16 degrees. Colder. Yeah. So it gets cold, very cold. So Riga and me. So sort of back um, like you I received for a number of years the Care Links emails and um, read about the, the work going on in there in the Bible feeding programme and the, sorry the, the winter feeding program. And I, I Six. Admit I was, I was tempted, but um, it's a big word that, but isn't it? There was always this sort of fear of the unknown, something different. I didn't know what it was like there. It was also the perceived cost of flights. You always think of, of reasons why you shouldn't do something. Um, I am reminded of a, a sister at a meeting who said, you, you're ready to be baptised when you can't think of a reason not to be. And it's, I suppose it's the same with going to someone like Riga, but you can't think of an excuse. Um, then you go. Uh, what finally um, kicked me into going was, uh, well, April had been my daughter uh, and my adopted, well, unofficially adopted granddaughter, Shelby, who calls me Gramps. <coughs> Someone should practice it Grumps, but that's maybe it's for me like hearing. And um, Sarah Harrison, now Sarah Bird, or previously Sarah Perrin, and her son Tom went, and they came back talking about it in brilliant terms. And then in August 2016, I was at an event which some of you were also at. Um, and in the corner, was, April was talking to Andy Downton. And then April wanders over to me and said, Dad, you've got to go to Riga with Andy in October because he's been on his own for two weeks at the start of the programme. So, it did remind me of a time when Harry Whittaker once said I need to kick up the backside from time to time to get me to do something. Maybe April was giving me the sort of kick up the backside. So, I booked the flight. 
and in October 2016 I went for the first time, decided to go for one week. I was prepared to go to two, but for two, but Andy said, well, let's just go for one, and we agreed, well, just to, to try it out to see if you, you do like it or not. And at least it will get him started on the program. <coughs> so I was out there with Andy and Maxim from Ukraine, which I'll mention, mention later on. He's a lovely brother. So I, I put the fight on him straight away, because I thought, if I don't, I shall then lose this <laughs> impetus and I won't go. But I went, and I, I literally loved it. I, I thoroughly enjoyed myself, it was a great time, and I committed there and then to, to go back. And I said I would come back at the, again at the start of the programme um, in October 17, uh, and I would go for two weeks, and it was going to be two weeks with Andy starting up again. Except, no Andy, because as you know, Sister Mel was uh, unwell and uh, well, having treatment, um, and Andy felt he couldn't go, so. I went on my own. Um, so I'm glad I'd had the week you could be four to actually <laughs> get me uh, a bit more knowledge of what was going to be happening. So it was the first week. Um, Maxim arrived on the Sunday. He'd, I, I can't remember the figure exactly, but I think it's something like it took him 63 hours on coaches from the Ukraine to get to Riga including eight hours stuck at the border with Poland to get into immigration control. Not just him, but the whole coach was out there. So that's commitment that he would do. And bear in mind, Maxim has a, a wife and a young child, and he left them in the Ukraine to come for months to be in Riga. Maxim arrived on the Sunday, I say, and uh, Cindy was there as well. Um, giving some hand, some time to help prepare, but it was still, she's obviously got the three children to look after, so it wasn't easy for her, so it was on my own a little bit, but we had a great time, Maxim and I. He kept calling me chef, and I kept passing, no, no, you're the one that has to sign with a paper saying, we put this meal, so, you know, it's, you're the chef. I want to run through um, a bit of the routine that goes on. Um, for two reasons, and I'll refer to these reasons again later, but firstly, for those of you who are thinking about going, it will give you an idea of what happens. For those of you who can't go, uh, but want to do something towards it, then prayer is the obvious way, and if you know more about what goes on there, in detail, your prayers become more informed, and I hope more impassioned as well. So we provide food five days a week from the Sunday through to the Thursday. The routine is similar for both of the timings on the Sunday are different to the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. Um, one hour when they come in, first of all, and have tea and coffee and chat and chat. And then one hour for a Bible talk where they talk to and ask questions. And they sometimes ask a lot of questions. Uh, and it delays um, us giving them the food, but that's, that's okay because it shows that they're there not just enduring the, the, the one hour talk in order to get the food, but they're there because they want to have that spiritual food as well. And a number of them are baptised as a result and keep coming. And then we give them the food, um, which is soup, and it's a hearty soup. Uh, it's a very nice soup. And, and bread and, and bris uh, biscuit, a treat afterwards. But they, they prefer. The food, the soup and the bread to the, the treat is just, is literally that. They, they don't come back for more biscuits, they come back for more soup. So carry on with the routine. We shop on a Saturday for the Sunday, and then shop on the Monday for Monday and Tuesday, and on Wednesday for Wednesday and Thursday. The reason for, for that sort of split is that the, the food is prepared um, fresh, obviously, and there are strict food and safety regs we have to comply with. So, for example, the meat is all freshly cut meat. It's not sort of frozen meat, we don't store anything, so we prepare it. So we have to keep the receipts for the meat, or well, receipts for all the food, and the labels of the meat containers with the dates on, best by date. And so they have to use food that is in date. And 
we have to keep all the receipts and, as I said, the meat labels. So we have to sh shop no more than two days ahead. We start preparations on Sunday at 9 in the morning and on the other days at 2 in the afternoon. So the routine is you wash your hands thoroughly. I mean, you've seen them scrubbing up for operations, it's like that. Cindy runs through a, a presentation before we actually start work there. And one of the key things is scrubbing you know, nails and near the palms of your hand here. And you, you, have to be, you have to ensure that you don't pass anything on to these people who are vulnerable. They're living on the streets all day long. You see some of them, they are, you can see that they have health issues. And you don't want to add to those health issues. You then put on a hat or a hair to keep the, my abundant hair under control. To get food in, you know, stuff in the food. And put an apron on. And we have to wear special clogs, special catering clogs. You'll see them in, I've got some photographs in a minute, courtesy of uh, Debbie and, uh, and Rob. Um, but we don't wear outdoor shoes in the kitchen in order to not bring contamination in. We then clean with a sanitizer all the worktops throughout the whole of the kitchen area. Turn the dishwasher on, which is partly washing, but also it does sterilise all the equipment. And then we put the water on in big saucepans, ready, and then we prep the vegetables and chop them into the meat. You'll see more of this, I'll send some photographs, which I'll run through in a minute, because I think a picture does paint a thousand words, quite literally. And then parallel to this, we also get the tea and coffee ready. Generally what happened was that Maxim would get the tea and coffee ready, and, and I and, and then anybody else would be prepping the food. Get the mugs out, and then we cook the soup. Wash up after uh, the tea and coffee. The soup generally, once we've prepped it, it sits for an hour just standing there. We, um, it keeps, it's amazing how it keeps hot, this large, tub of soup, which is about 30 litres of soup, how hot it will keep for the duration, for about that hour. We monitor, we stir it regularly, so you don't get any cold spots in it, because that's what can breed the infection. Stir it regularly and monitor the temperature. And then we get the trolley ready, because we wheel the stuff out in the trolley, so we put the bread on there, uh, the bowls, and then we, then we serve the soup, and then the great job of washing up afterwards. Thankfully we've got the dishwasher, we still do some pre-wash of the bowls, because I say the dishwasher, it washes a cycle in about three minutes. So if you've got 50 bowls in there, it's obviously not as, as thorough as your domestic one, but it does, at the end of it, do a steam cycle which sterilises the stuff. So get rid of the germs. Obviously while we were doing the cooking, the Bible talk was going on, um, and they then queue up, as you see in the photograph. After we've, we've done this, we've emptied the dishwasher out, and then we clean the worktops again. And we wash the floor, the whole of the kitchen floor is washed every day. Meanwhile, the main rooms, which you'll see on the photographs, are being cleaned, and the toilets being cleaned, usually by some of the people, other than the brothers and sisters from Riga, Kleja, or those other attendees who do it as a sort of favour or a task they want to do at the end of the day. So, a guided tour. Why? For the reasons I said earlier on. It will give you an idea. It would have helped me because I would have gone there knowing a bit. I'd seen photographs of the food being served but not of the sort of the other areas. So I'm going to give you a guided tour. First of all, just briefly describing the location and the setup there, and then some photographs that will work through the various parts of the building. The Bible Centre is located about four miles from Riga Centre, so it's a sort of semi on the outskirts. It was a casino before it was a Bible Centre, which is, there's an irony in there, I'm sure. <laughs> and there's a nightclub opposite, which thankfully wasn't too noisy. Maybe it's the double dazing that helps keep that noise down. But we've got a large kitchen, that's got a small seating area where we can pause in between the um, prep and the actual dishing up and a store in there and a laundry 
because there's all the tea towels we use and uh, other stuff. And there's a baptismal bath in there with its own water heater. There's a, there's a flat for staff, if you like, which is separate to the main area, and it's got its own kitchen, uh, one double and two single uh, bedrooms, uh, and a down, dining lounge area with Wi-Fi, and a printer to print off the, the meal and stuff. And there's a bathroom in there, obviously, as well. So we've got our own separate little area. So this is the outside. Most of the photographs are courtesy of, of, um, of Debbie and Rob, as I said. But this one is courtesy of Google, as you probably would see from the, the car that's reflected in there. It's their Google car that's going around. But that is the front doors of the Bible Centre. This is when you first come in. So the entrance is... Those doors you can see are where that light patch is just on the right of the photograph. And this is um, how you come into the main area. So you can see at the end there's a screen, much like this screen. There's a lectern. The chairs are the stacked at the side, but that's the main area where the Bible talks take place. Talks take place. And that's, that's a Bible talk taking place in there. As you see, it's in Russian. Uh, but there's a lot of people there. There can be more than that. We get between 50 and 100 people coming along. It starts off, when I've been there, the first day I think went 35 to 40 the first day, but then the word got around and over the week more and more people were coming. And then that's at the end of the talk, they're now moving over to queue up, ready to get to their, their soup. This is the room alongside it where they have the food. Um, you can tell it's a casino because underneath those sort of worktop areas on the side, there's an electrical socket every metre down there where they used to plug in the slot machines. And there they're, they're having their tea and coffee before the bubble talk takes place. They all chat, they know each other, they support each other. Now this is not to show you the people so much as this is the small area where we can sit. So that door behind, I think it's a sister from Canada, um, you can see that goes into the area where we serve the food, where they eat the food. Um, you can see there's a chap in, who's one, uh, one of the regular visitors in green. Just to his left, you can see some clogs on the shelf. That's where we store the clogs that we, we wear. And the baptismal bath, this is obviously just prior to a baptism, is actually on the far right of the screen there. This is into the kitchen. So we've got a storeroom on the left. You can see a shelf with all the bowls on. There's about 100 bowls, and they hold about half a litre of soup in each of the bowls. The dishwasher just below them, the main sink area, right at the front, there's the water heater on the, the right that heats the water for the washing up, separate to the one in the bar so that we never run out of hot water for a baptism, or warm water, don't put in the hot water, uh, and then the, the prep area on the right. So that's the food, food prep area, the stainless steel worktop you can see on the left is where we prep the meat, the little sink for washing off some vegetables, and then on the right underneath all the knives is the uh, workshop where we prep all the, uh, the vegetables. You can just see, you can see the white, that's a small cooker where we sort of pre-cook some of the meat before and the onions before it goes in the soup. And just past it is the large cooker. And it's an electric cooker with four large cast iron slabs on it which you, co you cook on. And they are awesome. Anybody who's cooked up with camp knows that the biggest problem cooking a large volume is burning stuff on the bottom. Yeah. We never, ever burnt anything on there because it's such a, such a spread of heat that 
stuff doesn't catch. You have to stir it to keep stop the hot spots, but not they're never hot enough to burn anything on. So it's really good cooker. I said about the shop. That's um, Rob and Daniel from um, New Zealand who came over. Young brother came over for about three months from New Zealand to do it. But that's the shop. You can see that there's a Maxima, not owned by Maxim, it's just a coincidence. It's, it's a supermarket, there's a chain, of, it's a bit like Tesco's and Sainsbury's. You see them all over Riga, various sizes from the, um, you see this has got a number of X's by it, there's actually three X's there, that means it's a large store, so it'll have um, food as well as electrical stuff, as well as clothes, everything in there. You get small, sort of like the, um, Tesco, St. Louis Local and Tesco One Stop, small ones, they just have one X on them. There's one just around the corner from the Bible Centre, which just does food enough for local people. But we usually do two trolleys worth, one trolley per day, so we keep the food separate. So you, when it was Maxim and I going around, I push one trolley, Maxim push the other, I get the food for Monday, we get the food for Tuesday. And that's the food prepped. Um, this is the soup I didn't actually make. This is sausage and celery soup. But we do borscht, do sweet corn and, and pasta soup. We do um, chicken and something else. I can't remember what the soups are now. There's, there's also one called Sunday soup. I never found out why it was called Sunday soup, but it is. I used to do it on Sunday sometimes. But you can see the various... is prepped. And we usually put it in different bowls so that you then can, it's easier then to get the ratios right when you put it into the main saucepans. And you can see on the right the cooker again and the big pans on there. You can also see actually a, a recent addition. We bought it, or, sorry, Duncan bought it, talk of the uh, proverbial. Duncan and Cindy bought it. Um, I don't think this thing's going to work. Above, at the far end, above the last lot of food, there's a device on the wall, which is a chipper. It's brilliant, isn't it? It's been, yeah. We used to hand chop all the, the potatoes and the onions. And Maxim is one of those people who, when he chops onions, <laughs> he, he cries. I'm fortunate, God bless me very much. I don't cry when I chop onions. But these are, that's very good. We just peel the potatoes, chop them in half, put them in that, and you've got potato wedges or potato chunks. Also, we found if you use the smallest one, which is for French fries, the smallest cutter in there, it's great for onions. So you can quickly do an onion, cut it in half, put it in there, chomp. Because it's a lot of onions. It's about five kilograms of onions at a time and, and ten kilograms of potatoes, which is a lot. So if you can cut down, it makes it a lot, life a lot easier. And this is the food then being served. In this case, is Debbie and Rob. And you can see the queue when you're around. You can see through into the, the kitchen area. So we've got the first area and then into the kitchen area in the background. Um, that's Daniel again and some of the helpers that are there. The guys in the middle of two of the ones that on this time were obviously helping clean up afterwards. And they've got um, a little gift of some, some more bread they take on with them to, to keep them going after they leave there. But you can also see they've got a NEV Bible and uh, Bible Basics there as well. A quick one of a baptism taking place uh, in the bath, which I say is in that first area as you go into the kitchen. And Debbie with a recently baptised sister with the water through the background. This is, this is Pasha. Pasha gets there. Uh, regularly f early, so usually they're prepping the vegetables and you can just tap on the window, this Pasha come along and he'll help set up and he's one of the last to leave. And that's just some of the receipts, this is just showing you we have to keep the receipts and I used to photograph them every night and send them to Vermel to restore, to store stuff. About 55, 50 to 55 euros a day it cost us in buying food for to feed between 80 and 90 hundred people. We do get some spare time, obviously on the Friday and Saturday, and this is part of Riga. And 
This is the, the Orthodox Church with its gold plated dome. And so it gets cold, that's the sea frozen. It has to get pretty cold to do that. But it's nice walking through, you do get some nice sights. It was nice walking back from Duncan Sydney's flat one night to the um, Bible Centre to see some graffiti that was actually positive. So, memories. For me, the, the first one was the unbelievable hardship that these people endure. I know it's, we say, there's always someone much worse off than you are, but these people are far, far worse off than I can even imagine. Yet, it's often said that most of us are one paycheck away from actually being homeless. Um, I put hostel there. Then, the second night I was there this year, Duncan and I went, well, Duncan went to, to hostel to try and talk to them there, to let them know that we were back in business, and just seeing what they have to put up with. The, the police dragging one of them in drunk and, and not exactly being very friendly. And then another night, Duncan went, Duncan and I went to where one of the guys was living. <coughs> we walked about half a mile down this dark, wet track to some allotments that, and one of them was, li they were living in the building on this allotment and it was freezing cold. We had to walk down this, I'm just thinking, I'm just glad I was able to do something to help in some way with that. The smiles, the smiles we got from the people getting the food, it was just, you wouldn't, if you saw them just in the room, you wouldn't realise what they had to put up with. But I saw what they had to put up with. But they still are able to smile and give you smiles of gratitude. And I remember my abiding memory of this gratitude is the first time I was there, there was this elderly chap, didn't see him this year or last year, but the first time, and he was determined to say thank you. Now I don't know whether it's because he English wasn't at all good or because he had a speech impediment. He was determined he was going to say thank you to me. And I just, and I was tempted, because you, you are tempted to finish somebody's words off for them, but I was not going to do it. I wanted him to, to do it, and he was so determined, and when he actually said it, you know, there was a smile on his face that he said, thank you. The appreciation and the acceptance people had um, of what you were doing, of their situation. At the end, we, we never threw any food away, there was never anything left. We might have some left for ourselves sometimes, but we'd always serve up them first. And they would come up for seconds, and sometimes thirds, and they make maybe take some home, um, home, back with them in a plastic tub for later. But I was amazed that they would queue up for these, the last drinks, and if we ran out and somebody didn't get any, it was never, oh, haven't you got any for me? It was, okay, that's the way it is, and move on. Just an acceptance of the situation they were in, and a gratitude for what they were, you were able to do for them. So. Will I go back? Definitely, God willing. Because it's and why? Because it's something I know I can do. I've now seen I can do it. I, in lots of ways through my life, I can see God working, getting me ready for what I'm doing now. At the time, I didn't see the reason for what was happening, but I can now. And it's just wonderful to share what I have, the skills I've got in able to, to do this, and the love that God showered on me to be able to give it back in some small way, it's just great. Regrets, when I leave, I hated going, having to leave, and not having done it earlier, because I wish I had. I think that's it. Oh. Yeah.
Ano na, na, 